is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Sex Education, Season 3, Episode 6. In this episode, we get to go with Eric to Nigeria, and thank God, nothing I was afraid of happens to him. Y'all don't even know how tense I was. So tense. Also, our old headmaster has come to Jean for some therapy. Men, take note. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Ashley for commissioning this episode. Ashley is here in the chat with me. So I want to say something that I keep meaning to say every episode and keep forgetting. Whoever it is, whomever it is, whomst, um, whoever it is that is responsible for choosing the music for this show should be fined and sued for damages <laughs> because the music is always so good and so on point and it's like devastating it wrecks me i do not understand how they keep managing to do it and i feel like this season has been particularly rough in that way like I've always noticed the music being on point, but this season it's felt like really going for the jugular kind of on point. And I'm really curious. I assume probably there is a like sex education soundtrack channel on like Spotify or something, which I don't have Spotify, but I am curious about just finding out what some of this music is because it's gorgeous. And especially this episode, we get a lot of, I am assuming Nigerian music. I'm assuming they chose music from the country he's visiting specifically for showcasing, but maybe not. Maybe it's just like sort of African in general. Um, but so much of the music from Eric's portion of this episode is just gorgeous. Um, so yeah, I just... Every episode, there's this moment where a certain song starts playing and I just feel myself like choking up and I'm like, why do you keep doing this to me? This definitely was probably the most emotional I've been watching an episode of the show in a minute, though. It was just... <sighs> the episode deals a lot with people feeling unwelcome, like outsiders, and like there is danger connected to who they are, like intrinsically. And watching that and the moments where there is like a bit of relief for them or not at times is so moving because this show does such a good job of showing the variety of ways that can manifest. And the first one that we see is Lily. And so last episode, I was saying that I felt like weird about the way that Lily has been reacting. And this episode gives a little bit more context to the reaction that she has to Ola. And it makes sense that like, in my opinion, she put words in Ola's mouth and, and was like jumping to conclusions that Ola was not actually stating about how Ola views her, I want to say fetish, but it's like, it's more than a fetish because it's like a whole, she's even non-sexually very interested in aliens and like space travel and all of that. So I feel like fetish is sort of minimizing it. I'm going to, but I'm going to say fetish because that's what Ola was specifically referring to. Um, but obviously she has had some run-ins regarding this already in her life. And it makes a lot of sense that, she would be extra sensitive to somebody who she trusted seeming to not be as into the thing as she is. And I feel like th there's a moment later where Otis is talking to Maeve and he says something about how Maeve has been ignoring his texts. And that is like, um, sort of an emotional, like 
soft spot or I don't think he uses the word trigger, but he uses some word and I was like, oh, okay, that's like the word for what's going on with Lily. Because the episode opens with her reading one of her stories to a girl at school and the teacher comes along and the girl is clearly like that she's reading to. She's keeping her reaction like understated, but she's obviously not really like here for this. She sort of tells on Lily the second that this teacher comes around and is like she wrote a story because she obviously kind of wants Lily to get nailed for this, which is just very sus. And then the teacher reads it and calls home and wants to know if everything is okay at home. And we get to meet uh, her mother, who is played by an actress that looked familiar. I feel like I saw her in like Harry Potter or something. Although God knows there's so many British actresses. But I love that she calls her Lily Pad, first of all. Adorable. And this woman essentially says... She asked if everything was okay. It was embarrassing. And Lily says, I like writing stories. And her mother doesn't tell her not to write them. Her mother says, maybe you should keep them to yourself. And this is really sort of a lot of the theme of this episode is not that people are being rejected necessarily. It is that the people around them are worried about how the world will react to them. And so they encourage people to keep things under wraps because they are in fear and feeling protective. And it's unfortunate because it manifests as, I don't want you to be who you are. That's what it like can look like. But that's not what it actually is. It's just that when you know how cruel the world can be and how not understanding or even attempting to be understanding a lot of people are, and you are, you really care about somebody that falls outside of the acceptable parameters, the easiest way to keep them safe is to hide the part of them that doesn't fit with our parameters. And it's awful because like, I completely understand where the protective aspect is coming in and why they are reacting this way. But I also, of course, understand the reaction of the, per the reaction of the person on the receiving end of this, who feels like their closest friends or family aren't accepting them for who they are. And, you know, in Eric's case, it turns out because I had asked this question, what's going on there with his mom? Because his mom clearly knows he's gay, but doesn't really like really address it. And it turns out she says something like, I'm glad that you are not afraid to be who you are, but it t for me, it will take some time. So she is aware and it doesn't seem like she has a problem with it. In principle, I think she recognizes that it's her issue to deal with. And a lot of it may, might come from coming from a country in which Eric would be jailed. Eric would be killed, potentially, for who he is. And there has got to be a real knee-jerk reaction in a parent who's like, well, I don't want that for my kids, so clearly that's not who they are. That's the easiest way out of this, is that they're not gay. So I'm just going to like pretend they're not because otherwise I can't deal with what the fucking consequences of this could be. I have some sympathy for that. And I appreciate that they finally have this talk because I was just so confused about the nature of what is going on between her and his identity. And I, I, it's like somewhat cleared up. At least it feels like it's been addressed directly. And that is really all I wanted because I am sure that this sort of situation exists a lot more than I realize where it's like, there's an understanding of somebody's sexuality, but it is never explicitly said out loud. And so both parties dance around it weirdly. This sort of like is reminding me of a situation I had with my uncle um, who was on my father's side. And he knew that my dad was born again and was very anti-gay. 
And it was also extremely obvious that he was gay. So every time we got together, it was just unsaid. And any time that he referred to anybody he was seeing, he would say they the way that Eric does. And yet I was always like, yeah, but you're gay, though. And it took me so long to really understand that he wasn't speaking openly because he knew my father was going to give him a hard time about it. Um, which is hilarious because my father had been bisexual, but all of a sudden just wasn't. So that's just the magic of being born again for you. Um, oh, Ashley says, oh, my God, Natasha, you're 100 percent right. She was in Harry Potter. She was Mathilda Hopkin. I don't understand how you recognize someone in such a minor role. Hopkirk, Mathilda, Hop- Mathilda, right? Yeah, I don't know what that is, Ashley. I don't remember actors names ever. I am so bad. But if you show me a face, I will be able to tell you like almost 80% of their IMDb. I don't know why it's the face that I remember, but it, the name is not relevant. I never remember that part. <laughs> not great for my job, but to be honest, not awesome. Um, so anyway, Lily is taught to keep it to herself. She meets Ola and it seems like Ola is going to get it. And Ola goes with it and isn't judging her for it exactly. But then we have the fight last episode where Ola straight up says, I can't believe you believe in aliens. And that takes it to a different level where it's not just like, I would also like to have regular sex where I feel like I'm connecting with you as a person. Mm -hmm. It's taken it to kind of a personal place, you know, and now Lily is feeling unsafe. And we also find out that Lily, when she showed Ola her story and Ola was like, I'm not sure this is what you want to submit. Ola was doing the thing that Lily's mother did, which is to say, encouraging her to keep her weirdness to herself. Understandably a soft spot. So then the story gets published And that means that Lily is on the front page of the paper and there's a whole article with quotes from her story and talking about the delinquency and like the, uh, I can't remember the word that's used, but there is just overall an assault on the reputation of the school yet again, based on what Lily wrote. And it is wild to me that this is how a newspaper responds to what I'm assuming is a minor writing a story. That's the thing that kept distracting me is that did they not like, it seems like this is a surprise to Lily that she is that her fucking face is plastered on the very front page in a like, you know, a five by seven size photo. It's big. And I have to think that that's not exactly allowed, but for the sake of the story, all right, fine. And this is one of the first nails in the coffin for the new headmistress, because she also goes to her office and finds out from one of the people who's like an investor. I'm not clear what his actual title is, but he found out before she did about some of the incidents in uh on the trip to france she also overhears somebody talking about it on in the hallway like on the way to her office and it's just embarrassing and he tells her basically if we don't improve the reputation of this school pretty substantially pretty quickly we aren't going to get the funding we need to even keep the school open And this is the kind of thing where I feel like a little bit of communication could potentially create an entirely new situation. What this teacher is trying to do is strong arm and bully the students into behaving a certain way for an outcome that is desirable to all parties, and that is the school continuing to be funded and open. But she is not sharing the danger of the school closing 
as a, a consequence of the continued problems that they are having with their public image. And I can't help but feel as much as these kids are resentful of hope for very understandable reasons, they do want the best for their school. And it feels like if she told them what was on the line and got them to understand the real situation here, they would work with her in a much more cooperative and mature way because they would understand what is on the line. And she's just not choosing to share that. And I'm not certain if it's supposed to be a secret or what the deal is. It's also sort of a weird thing because he talks about the investors and I have never dealt with a school that isn't public. I, like I went to a private school in California, but it was for one year and I was on a massive scholarship and I don't know what investment return people expect to get from a private high school. It's just sort of a weird, like, is it, is it for profit, this school? I don't really understand what the, the dynamic is there. You know, if this were just like, oh, we need funding from the school district, like you do with the public school, and they aren't happy with the leadership and they're not going to give you the extra budget, that is something that I understand. But because of the language that's being used with this, it feels like a business. And I don't really get how that works in this scenario. Um, Ashley says, seems like a pretty cut and dry glass cliff case. She wants to use Viv as a black woman to highlight how progressive the school is, which is the same thing as the investors are doing, putting hope in her position. Ashley, I'm sorry. I don't know. I'm not familiar with glass cliff. What does that mean? Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk about what's going on with Viv a little bit later. But yeah, so she has this encounter with this dude who really puts a lot of pressure on her. And it's followed right away with Maeve coming in. And Maeve has found out that she qualifies for the Talented and Gifted program. And she comes to ask Hope whether it will be possible to get the funding. And this is a really weird moment that I can't decide. It's it's like... I want to give Hope the benefit of the doubt in some ways, but I also, what she does later is so reprehensible and she seems to know it. That's the part that I have trouble with. It's like, I don't get me wrong. If somebody really believes in what they're doing and what they're doing is awful, I'm not saying I excuse it by any means because you know, I don't y'all anybody familiar with me is like aware, but there's a different sort of violation happening if you believe in the wrong thing versus doing the wrong thing when you are aware it's the wrong thing. And that's really what I'm getting from Hope is that she knows what she does later is fucked up and she is desperate and just like it, it's just so gross because of that. Um but Maeve comes in and she tells Maeve, we aren't going to be able to find the funding. And because of the conversation that she just had with this guy, it could just be things didn't go the way that she wanted. And when she made the suggestion to Maeve that we could potentially find the funding, she meant it. However, it could also be basically what Jackson says to Viv later, which is to say, you have to know she doesn't care about your hopes and dreams, right? She's not on your side. And that she told Maeve what she needed to say to Maeve in order to get Maeve to follow the rules, promising her something in return that she not only had no intention of giving, but wouldn't have been able to give. Like that she was aware it wasn't even there to hand out. And that feels more likely you know, I want to give her the benefit of the doubt that she really meant what, like what she was offering to be a real offer. But because she feels so morally compromised, I really think she knew she wasn't going to be able to deliver. 
and just wanted to do what she had to do to get Maeve to fall into line. And it's like so extra gross because of Maeve's situation with money that and and that fight that Maeve just got into in the last episode that the the kind of it feels like she knew Maeve's weakness regarding her financial situation and blackmailed her with it a little, you know, and it wasn't like a real black like she wasn't leaving her no choice, but she was giving her a carrot and it wasn't actually a carrot. And this is the kind of thing that especially capitalism really does. And especially these days, there is this like old fashioned belief that working hard and proving yourself will give you an upward boost on the career ladder. Those days are long behind us. This is what we have now, the promise of something better in exchange for more work and more dedication. And then you give them more work and more dedication. And they regretfully inform you that in their current position, they can't exactly deliver. But if you continue to sustain this work level, you're certain to get some positive attention because there is something coming down the road in six months when the new budget comes along. And we're probably going to be able to fit that in then. And in six months, they will give you the same fucking answer. And that will happen for four years. I am just saying, it's not even just personal experience. This is the experience of several of my very close friends. And it is fucking so predictable at this point. So Maeve is kind of getting a taste of what it's like out there in the world. And not that she needs it because Maeve fucking knows better than anybody at this school what the world is like. So there's that. Um, Ashley says it comes from the idea of the glass ceiling, women being brought into head failing businesses because putting a woman in charge is seen as changing things up. And then when it fails, you can blame the woman and stick with the status quo with other companies because they hired a woman and look what happened to them. I remember that like tactic being talked about in an, I, I don't remember what company it was. It might've been Yahoo. Some, some company, it wasn't Tumblr cause that was bought by a dude. But there was some company that brought in a woman and it was like that exact situation. And I remember reading an article about that tactic. Thank you, Ashley. I didn't know glass cliff was the word used, but that's very clever because, yeah, they're on the like edge of it and they're just going to fall. Hmm. Yeah. It's like the same thing as like having a like a single female led action movie per year and all of the hopes and dreams of every woman riding on this one movie because we only get the one. And if it doesn't do amazingly, everybody just says that women can't do action movies, whereas men get to have 15 per year more, let's be real, but let's say 15 and 11 of them fail. But it's just not noticed because they have so many opportunities that they can fail a million times more and it's fine. So yeah, this, this thing with Maeve too, she's dealing with a lot this episode and I'm just going to finish what's going on with her. Um, well, actually, no, I can't because I had started with Lily and what Lily is going through and what Cal is going through and then what's going on with Adam all tied together because of the fucking thing at the assembly. Um, Adam gets a text from Eric saying things are great in, in Nigeria. There's so much food, having a great time. How's things at school? And then Eric doesn't hear back all day because Adam gets his phone taken away. And this is another thing. Adam goes home and he doesn't have a phone. So he has to email Eric. And I'm like, she shouldn't be able to just take your property for the duration of the school day. Sure. But having it in custody, even when you go home, no. There's like a lot of things with this show in terms of the way like the world operates that they do not get right. But because they get so many of the like sexual and social issues right, I am willing to overlook those things. Um, especially because as much as this is not how it should work, sometimes schools really do fucked up shit that you wouldn't think would be allowed and you'll find out it was. So you know, it, it was it was allowed either explicitly or everybody knew about it, but nobody really did anything kind of thing. So it's fine, whatever. Um, but yeah, Adam is still being held responsible for the chucking shit out the window. And 
Cal has a run in with Hope in the hallway. And Hope once again is like, why won't you wear the fucking uniform correctly? And Cal asks, what does that mean? What do you how like quantify what you mean by correctly? And Hope calls over another student, another non-binary student, and I cannot remember what their name is, but they're wearing the uniform in a much more traditionally sort of femme look because it's like more body hugging. And the word that Hope uses later to describe Cal is slovenly. And I cannot... Oh, like, I cannot overstate how wrong... Like, there is nothing about Cal that looks slovenly at all. Cal's clothing is relaxed, but not... Like, slovenly for me is... You have stains on your clothes, there are holes in them, or you're, like, wearing things in such a way that they're, like, kind of falling off you because you aren't paying attention to how they fit. Um, and Cal's clothing just doesn't do that. There's nothing about Cal that gives the impression of like not caring about their appearance. There is care put into it. It's just not the fucking image that Hope wants. And there's a really interesting moment where Cal is like, so they're a good non-binary, but I'm not. And it's so Hope just says, I don't understand your slang because she says NB. And then when Hope sends away the other girl, the other person, um, Hope, Cal says to Hope, why is it that you always separate us? Is there too much power in more than one of the other is like kind of the way that Cal says it. Essentially, if there are two black people versus you, you can't have that. So you send one of them away. If there's two non-binary people, you can't have that. So you send one of them away. And I never really picked up on that being what was happening, but it's not only correct. It didn't like the fact that Basically, what Hope did here was weaponize one non-binary person against another is so gross. Like, that is, ab Layla, thank you, Ashley. That is just, I mean, if Layla had realized that was what was about to happen, I don't know if they would have done anything differently because they don't really, they're not given lots of choice. Um, but it would really make me feel extremely gross. Like, any time that a, a dude has ever tried to tell me you're not like other girls. It's one of those things where I'm like, well, wait, what does that mean? Because I am, I'm a lot like most other girls. I don't even know what you mean. And it makes me get my hackles up because I'm like, well, you're insulting my gender and trying to make me an exception. And that's not right. That's not cooler. I don't feel good about that. So I can only imagine being like, held up as, see, this person is obedient. They fall outside of the binary, but they're presentable. It's fine. Is like much, much grosser. Um, oh shit. Ashley says, oh no, that definitely happened with us. Confiscated until Friday and then your parent can pick it up or it's held on to until your parent could come and collect it. No shit. All right. I stand corrected. I had no idea schools were able to do that. Like just taking your property doesn't seem like it should be allowed. Taking it for the school day to make sure that you're not distracted. Sure. But just taking it, that just doesn't feel right. Um, anyway. Okay. So this leads to the fateful assembly in which Hope, who is clearly at her wit's end, she's on stage and she looks like she is about to fall apart. Hope calls up Lily and Cal and Adam and has them each read aloud a statement that she has written for them on a sign and makes them wear the sign for the rest of the day. And it's truly like one of the, it's amazing how some th kinds of punishment do not 
entail any physical violence at all. And yet they feel violent. This is the kind of thing that is abusive. And it's not ex- like, it's not the kind of thing that if you explain to somebody what happens in this scene, I feel like there's no getting across how awful it is unless you watch the scene. Um, this is the sort of thing that I feel like women especially deal with a lot where we find ourselves on the receiving end of like certain types of harassment. And when you try and tell somebody what was so uncomfortable and made you feel so unsafe, just relaying the words doesn't adequately express the threat of that moment. And so there's no getting like, there's no really showing them the feeling of that moment. It's so diluted once you start to express it, you know? So she has them each read their statement. Cal's is about being slovenly and like embarrassing the school. Lily's is about writing filth. And Lily's is so, that one got me in like a different way because she says, I don't think what I wrote was dirty. And Hope says, then why are they all laughing at you? Which that kind of bullying of a child is just, I mean, I don't know how Hope sleeps at night. I really don't. That is just beyond the pale. Just being like, oh, look, everybody who is laughing and mocking you is actually right. And I'm definitely going to take their side because you're a freak, you know? And then Adam has an issue with reading his because he has difficulty with reading. And it's just like all of it is just so embarrassing and awful. And not only does she make everyone wear their sign all day until she tells them they can take it off. But she says nobody is allowed to speak with them all day either, isolates them. And that for like that, it was already so bad. But I think when she says nobody can speak to them, that made me gasp out loud because that is just next level. This is like shunning in a Puritan village in like, you know, 1580. It's just, what? Like, we don't do this. What are you doing? And Jackson, for his part, when Cal is being shamed, stands up and is like, this is fucked up. And he's told to sit and he does. But then when Adam is receiving his punishment, Raheem stands up and tries to stand up for him and he's told to sit and he won't. And she suspends him, which causes everybody because like Raheem is sort of the model student, like he's the good kid. And for him to get suspended, ew, you know, although I did have to laugh because later Adam comes to see Raheem at home and says, I feel bad because you're being suspended for me. And I'm like, no, Adam, you're taking the fall for something he did. He's getting some consequences for the thing that he actually did. So you shouldn't feel bad. This actually sort of pans out to being now you're even, to be honest, in my opinion, <laughs> you know, but whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, oh, Ashley says, did you notice Cal changed their sign later? Because I didn't cop that until today. No, I didn't see what is what did the sign say? Uh, but that's fun. Good for you, Cal. So, okay, that's what's going on there. It's awful. I just, the tension in that room and the way everybody's reacting where it's a moment of looking around and being like, I'm not crazy. This is insanely fucked up, right? Like, this is the kind of thing I feel like is, it, it, it's so scary to watch because this is our government. This is like, this is real. This is how it happens. Something that feels over the top is done. Nobody is actually really able to do anything about it in the moment, even though they're all aware it's wrong. And then you get used to it. Like time begins to pass and it becomes so normalized that it doesn't even feel that crazy anymore. 
And that is like what has happened. Um, so, all right. Now we're talking about that. I talked about Raheem and Adam going to see Raheem. Adam wants to write poetry. Raheem says that what he wrote is bad. He does not mince words. And I love the moment when Raheem is like, well, what do you like? And Adam says, dogs. And when Raheem says, I'm a cat person, Adam just says, of course you are. And like snatches the poem out of his hands. That shit made me laugh out loud. I was cracking. That was such a good moment. Um, Meanwhile, with Maeve, not only does Maeve get this news about not getting the finances to do the trip to America, um, but I should mention, too, that this show has been sort of like not really explicit in stating where it the like the school is located exactly. But this season, they've made lots of references to England, the trip to France and being able to drive there and everything. They've like really said it in a way they haven't in other seasons. Um, it doesn't matter, but I just thought it was interesting. So, <clears throat> Ooh, Ashley says Cal changed their sign to your bias is not my problem. That's amazing. Love you, Cal forever. Um, so Maeve is talking to Otis in the hall about getting into the program and she gets a text about, or no, she gets a call from Isaac about her mother came to take a walk with her little sister and took off. Uh, It was an unsupervised walk. She has vanished with her little sister. And as we find out later for this, she could face jail time. Like this is a very serious thing that she's done. And it's so awful because her mother is desperate in a way that like, it's just a really difficult thing for me to wrap my head around being willing to risk everything this way. When you already are on a knife's edge in terms of what you are allowed to have, it just feels like saying you've got nothing left to lose doesn't apply here at all. You have everything left to lose. And her choosing this is such, it's just such a bad choice on so many levels. Like one, what if you get caught and then you get put away and your daughter doesn't have a mother that can come and see her anymore? What about your other daughter who is now left holding the bag about what's happening to you? And you're going to continue to blame Maeve for what you've been doing and how you've been treating them. This was nothing to do with her and you didn't have to do this and behave this way. And the woman who is taking care of your daughter is actually doing a great job and seems to genuinely give a shit. And the way she interacts with Maeve at one point, like, you shouldn't even have to be dealing with this. You're 17. This is too much. And Maeve sort of smirks because it's like, she probably shouldn't, but she's been dealing with this for so long now that it doesn't even feel like too much anymore because she's so used to it. But it's clear that this woman cares about Maeve too. Like... This this whole thing could be an opportunity for her to really fix it. And she's just fucking it up. And in the midst of this comes Otis and Isaac throwing back and forth at each other, acting like they're here to help Maeve when, in fact, they just want to overshadow one another. And Maeve rightfully is like, this is not the fucking time And then Isaac realizes because of like this moment between uh, when when Otis is like arguing, Otis says something like, I can't believe she would choose you instead of me. And Isaac is like, choose? What do you even mean? And then he realizes something happened between them. And he pulls away and just goes home. Look, I get feeling a way about that. Isaac, you lied to her about the text message. And once you revealed that information, you had to know that unfinished business was going to come back up. You come on, Isaac. Be real, kid. Like, I, if, if I were in Isaac's position and I revealed that kind of information, I would low-key assume that those people are going to possibly hook up and like leave me behind. And he got forgiven by Maeve for what he did. But 
that doesn't change the fact that there was something going on that you interrupted unnaturally. And of course, once you put that to rights, things are going to sort of regain momentum. That's part of the risk you take in telling the truth. So if you can't take this development, you're not being honest with yourself about what you did and the consequences of what you did. Because this is just, this is, of course, how things were going to play out. They weren't allowed to actually deal with the reality of their relationship and end things on their own terms. You chose to end it for them. So you handed the reins back and they're finishing it the way they need to. They're figuring it out. You didn't give them the chance before and now they're doing it. So that's on you, Isaac. I don't feel bad for you. I'm sorry. I just don't. This is just... Maeve is in a situation that you put her in, frankly. And I'm just, I don't feel bad for him. He needs to sit this, sit this one out, honestly. And like being angry at her feels just out of line. And I know that it's fair to be like, well, she lied to him about making out without, she wasn't even make out. It was just a kiss really. But I don't care. I truly don't. Like, after what he did, I'm just so firmly in Maeve's corner on all of this all the time that I just can't find it in myself to, like, be upset for him. Um, Otis, meanwhile, is so mad because he fucked it up again. And <laughs> Ashley in the chat says, not to mention the missing toddler. For all they know, she's dead in a ditch and Isaac is getting pissy about this. Had zero patience for both of the guys. Agreed. Yeah, because he's just basically like, oh, I'm here to help and offer support. And as soon as he finds out that something happened between her and Otis, all of a sudden, he doesn't want to be supportive anymore. I think that says a lot about him. You know, Otis was the one that was like, I will still stay. And she is, tells him to go home. But Isaac didn't even offer to stay. Once he realized that Maeve wasn't like explicitly his and on the table, he retracted his assistance such as it was. And I really think that that's telling. That's it for me, you know? So anyway, she sends Otis home and he has this like moment of just talking about how he can never have any healthy adult relationships. And his mother, who had a moment with uh, Amy earlier and Amy blurted out about what's going on with Otis, his mother kind of presses the issue about what's going on with Maeve, even though he never talked to her about Maeve and shouldn't even like really know Maeve's name as far as I remember. So Otis immediately is like, what the fuck? And throws it in her face that this is highly unethical of her to be sort of, she pushed with Amy asking about Otis. Amy Amy brought it up, but it was Jean's responsibility to be like, you're right, let's steer away from Otis. And she didn't. She asked more questions. She wanted to know, not ethical. And then when she's like trying to say, I want to help, Otis says, how do you think you can help? The guy that you had move in with us isn't even sleeping in the same bedroom with you anymore. You can't sustain a healthy relationship with any men. So trying to tell me you're going to help with my relationships is just comical. That's not happening. And as much as I feel like he's being kind of unfair, he's not totally wrong. And I think that's what's so like devastating about it. And she knows he's not totally wrong. Her and Jakob have a conversation about how to talk to the kids about what's going on between the two of them. And Jakob says that it should be between her and him. And she doesn't agree. And he's basically like, well, then tell them then. But he doesn't want to do it with her. He's not in, like viewing this as a team thing. He's viewing it as like, you're on your own. And if you you choose to do this thing, I'm not participating in it. Um so, yeah, it's just like what's going on with her and Jakob is honestly so painful to watch because I really like both of them and I want the best for both of them. But they are – they're not well matched so far in the way they're choosing to approach marriage and parenthood. And it's interesting to me how little they knew about each other in this respect before they, like, decided to embark on this together. Um, So – and speaking of Amy, just really quick, I want to touch on that appointment. She has these like vulva cupcakes that she has made. Amazing. I love Amy's matter of fact 
approach to sex and everything about sex. She is so unembarrassed and it's just so wonderful. I love her. I think she might be like my favorite character on this show, to be honest. And she like goes into Jean's office and Jean's like reorganizing her men's magazines that she's been collecting vintage men's magazines. And Amy just is like, lots of tits. Like, just as a matter, like the way that you would say lots of pillows if somebody was a pillow collector and there was just a ton of them on the couch. And uh, when Jean says something about reorganizing the collection, Amy just says they're lovely before sitting down. And she starts talking about the fight with Maeve and about how she feels she hates making people feel bad. And so she just tells them what they want to hear in the moment. This is so difficult because it's a weird – I have this like – all or nothing sort of thing with my attitude. I am either such a people pleaser that I will let you literally hurt me while you're giving me a mani pedi or doing my hair rather than tell you that I'm having a bad time. Or I will not stop criticizing you all the time. And that usually happens, unfortunately, with the people that are closest to me, usually husbands. And it is like, I don't know where the one goes and the other. It, it's like, I think the criticism part where it's in person and I'm like, it's with somebody I know better. I really believe that it's me wanting better for a person and believing that they can improve and wanting them to understand the exact place they went wrong especially with Owen being younger than me. There's a lot of parts of like life that he hasn't encountered quite yet or hadn't when we first met that he's like finally started to catch up on. And I am like, look, I went through this and I don't want you to. So let me tell you exactly the ways in which you are walking down the wrong path and you are going to get hurt. But it comes across as just a nonstop criticism. And I'm aware of it. And I'm really working on it, I swear. But it is so wild how different that part of me is versus another part of me that never wants people to be hurt and just like keep shit to myself to the point where I'm hurting both of us by not communicating. And um, it's just a really, I, I really understand the people pleasing thing. And she says explicitly what I said in the last episode about friends who know you so well that they're able to really say some shit that's true and they're hurtful and they might use words that aren't kind, but you know they're right and that's what makes the fight so awful is, you know, she says Maeve is telling me to break up with Steve and what's awful is I know that she's probably right and I know that I probably won't do it because I just can't bear to do that to him. And then we get this moment that got me teary eyed and I'm like feeling choked up now where then she says, I'm such a people pleaser that I probably like encouraged the guy on the bus by smiling at him. And if I hadn't been so eager to please, he wouldn't have done that. Oh, man. Wow, show. Way to bring this back around in a way that feels just so rude and unfair and extremely fucking true. Oh, and what kills me is there's a moment later where Hope's talking to Vivian says, I would hate to see you fail because you're interested in playing nice, which is a very female trait. And what's awful is that like hope isn't wrong, but she's just, she's taking the wrong message away from it. And Amy is doing the thing that hope is accusing Viv of maybe doing. And I just hate this so much for her. There is not a woman alive. And I will say this with no fucking compunction whatsoever. There is not a woman alive who has not experienced sexual harassment and also thought they invited it somehow. Even if you know that you didn't invite it, you still kind of think maybe you did something to invite it. It's so insane. Insidious. 
I can't like I am somebody who is very aware of that kind of mind trick and I will still do that. And it's just I can't believe how good society has gotten at getting us to doubt our own experiences and blame ourselves for the shit that men are doing. It is wild how effective this brainwashing is. And Amy's just like moment of if I hadn't smiled at him like that, maybe he wouldn't have done it. I uh, like I just felt like somebody had punched me in the face because of course, of course she would think that. Of course she would think that. And like she knows better and I know she knows better. But still, like, you know, and Jean manages to be like, I need you to like listen to me and hear me. How many people have you smiled at and how many of them have sexually assaulted you? This had nothing to do with anything you did. And I believe that Amy hears her in that moment. But I just hope she's able to really keep it. Because it's so easy to hear something in a moment. And then later on, you repeat those words to yourself and they don't feel effective anymore. You know? Oh, so awful. Um, all right. So uh, there's uh, just to finish up with Jean. Um Michael is the name of the old headmaster, right? I swear to God, I ask his name every episode. This dude turns up having broken a flower pot. And apparently he was just going to like leave Jean's notes on her porch or in her mailbox or something and bail. But she managed to catch him. And we have this incredible moment she asks him to come inside and talk with her. And I wasn't sure if he'd take her up on it, but he does. And she asks him about photocopying the pages of her notes. And he admits that he did and that he's ashamed of himself. And then says he's just reread everything his wife told her about him over and over. And that he thinks she's right. And Jean asks for some descriptions of his mother. And he says she was really warm and loving and kind. And we get this beautiful like memory that's got that gold tinted light of his mother separating eggs while she's baking a cake or something. And just this feeling of affection and safety and then she asks about his father. And I will tell you what, guys, another emotional moment where I started to get choked up. I'm getting choked up just now. All he says initially is, my father was different. It's like, I feel like that's almost all he says. He may have says he may have said a different sort or a different type, something like that. But the gravity behind that one sentence, the weight is, it's so, it's like granite. It's like, this is something that I, because of, this is why I'm getting choked up is because my father, experienced a lot of horrific shit, which in a lot of ways leading to him becoming born again, it sort of makes sense that he ran to a religion like this to give him some structure and a feeling of safety and a family. But he went through some really rough shit and I'm talking all different kinds of abuse and then basically becoming a child soldier kind of fucked up shit. Like we're talking next level. He could have written a book and had it made into a feature film kind of thing. And the tone of voice that people who, with, who have experienced that type of trauma have, when you start to edge a little too close to those things, this guy really nails it. It's like a wall, like 
comes down from the ceiling and just slams shut. And what's so moving about this scene is that he seems aware that's happening and he's trying to fight it. He wants to talk about it, you know, but he's not used to letting anybody listen to this part of what he's experienced in his life. My father, it was not like that. He let that wall slam into place. And that was that. And you had better back off. Because it was not pretty. If you tried to push after that, it was bad. And we get to see how his father bullied him with his brother. And the whole thing with his brother, I like forget he has a brother because he was in it for such a brief moment. But um, his brother and his father are bullies in a different way than he was with Adam, but they're still bullies. And I can't tell you guys how fucked up it is that we will perpetuate the shit our parents did to us, even though we're not trying to be that. Like, how is it that we will know that they did damage and we will be like, I don't want to do that to my kid or to other people. And then one day we'll step back and look at it and be like, oh my God, that was my father's voice that just came out of my mouth. I have this all the time. My father was so controlling. And this is part of my criticism, like constantly with people who are really close to me. My dad was the most charming guy with people he didn't know well. But when it came to close family, he was relentless. And I have unfortunately perpetuated that. And I'm really working on it. But it's just not fun to step back and realize that you're like doing the thing that was done to you. It sucks. You feel like such a, a a mark in a way. Like I can't like you know that this is a thing in in society like a cultural thing of oh you just perpetuate what your parents did. You know that that's something that is said, but I think most of us consider ourselves an exception. Like we're not going to do that. Most people do that, but I won't do that. You know? Oh, no, no, no. That's not how that works. So I am really excited to see what happens with him. We see him after this moment go home and start making a cake and doing the egg separating that his mother did. And it's just so beautiful and moving. And I loved it so much. So I'm almost over time, but I'm going to talk about Eric now. And I'm going to t start with the fact that Eric doesn't experience some horrific storyline that is a punishment for him of some kind or there is none of that. And I am so glad because I'll tell you what, when he gets in this car with this photographer and there's the weirdness in the car, I really thought for a second that he had been set up and was being brought somewhere where he was going to be thrown in jail. I had a fucking awful feeling. It was just truly. And it turns out that the vibe in the, the, taxi is really off because they have to pretend that they aren't who they are in front of the driver because the driver is not safe. I thought the driver was like in on whatever was going on with the photographer. Oh my God. Thank God. I'm so glad that wasn't it because I swear I was, I was ready to throw up. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I was so anxious this whole time. And um, we get to see this beautiful Nigerian wedding and the couple dancing and everybody's like showering them with money. Amazing. The clothes. Oh, my God. The like crowns that the women are wearing, these like headdresses. Unbelievable. This stuff is so beautiful. And um, he gets to wear like one of the traditional outfits. And it's just amazing. And I love that I, as soon as this photographer showed up, I was like, oh, okay, this might be a little bit of an issue. Uh-oh. Like, I knew this guy was going to be a problem. And he winds up convincing Eric to go with him to, like, an after-party thing at this club. And I thought it was a setup, but no, he goes inside to check exits, escapes, and invites Eric in. And it turns out there are some people that Eric knows already in this club. And... 
there's a moment of him standing there looking around and being so like overwhelmed by this scene of first of all probably like the first time that he's i don't know how many times he's been to nigeria has he he's mentioned before is this his first time um but being in a club that is all black and that is apparently like really queer i can't imagine how amazing that must feel when you have been in a place where there's like two options of love interest and everyone else is white except for like, you know, three people. I mean, you know, this is one of those moments where there was somebody um, in the unspoiled uh, Facebook group who was talking about the experience of after living in a really small town, going to some like club that had that it was like a gay club or a queer club and the moment of being surrounded by other people who were also gay and queer and that it was safe to be completely themselves and how it was the first time they ever experienced that and it was just an unbelievable feeling and uh it's just so beautiful i was so relieved that there's this like moment of sort of freedom for him and he kisses this dude which i was kind of like oh no but also Again, Eric hasn't had a lot of options. So finding out that there's this like bigger world out there, I feel like is kind of part of growing up, you know, learning what it's, what is out there, what your options are. And I'm really glad he doesn't like go any further with this guy. He wakes up in the morning and he's like, did we? And the dude says no. But I really like the fact that he has an experience that sort of makes him aware there's a lot out there. It may not feel like it where you are, but the world's a big place and maybe don't completely like discount your other options just because you've only lived a small slice of your life, you know? And eventually he has that moment with his mother. She was like really worried about him understandably when he didn't come home and then he has a confrontation with her because she was flirting with this guy who she used to date that her mother expected her to marry because the guy was rich. And when he's talking to his grandmother about his own father, his grandmother assumes that Eric's dad is like super successful and an accountant and everything in England. And thus, she now approves of him because she, he proved her wrong. But that is not actually Eric's father. That's not what's going on. And so Eric basically is like, um, I want to know if you regret marrying my dad because you were flirting with this guy all night. Like, what is going on? And she assures him, no, 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 that's not what I'm... The guy is really vain and it was like fun to reconnect with him and everything, but no. And he asks, well, then why are you lying about dad? And she basically is like, because it was easier. It, I just, I don't want to deal with your grandmother's disapproval. I just don't want to deal with it. And she is doing the thing, perpetuating now, that Eric has to like kind of lie about himself to her a little bit because she doesn't want to deal with things because she doesn't approve, you know? Um, just, wow, we really do like carry on fucking cycles. It's just not, it's just, ugh. So it ends with him saying, I don't want to pretend anymore. And her being like, just, it takes time, but she's clearly trying. And then on their way out, her grandmother says, or her mother says something to Eric about like, let me know when you have a girlfriend. And his mother says, Eric has actually been seeing someone, but I didn't want to say anything until I knew it was serious and gives Eric the opportunity to share some things about Adam without saying that Adam is a man. And the last moment of the episode is Eric riding in the car headed to the airport and looking like he has just had the time of his life and feeling like a weight has been lifted. And it's just a really nice moment. I really liked this a lot. And I like, Eric getting to see that his mother also has like a pressure on her that causes her to keep things from her parents. Like 
and and to use that to be like you know how much this sucks do you really want me doing this too is that how you want our relationship to be you know mm-hmm. it was just great so anyway um all right so i am going to wrap up but thank you guys so much for listening thank you ashley again for commissioning this and I hope y'all are enjoying the coverage. This season has been so good so far. I can't believe there's only two episodes left. I'm devastated. And I will see you soon with a new one. Until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.